All right. We have a phenomenal Torah study this morning. Now, as you can see up on the screen, that is our, not our Torah portion. There is our Torah portion. All right. And what does that word say? Vayetze. That's right. And what does it mean? That's what it means. And he went out. This is about Jacob as he's leaving the promised land. And what's so fascinating, when you read this Torah portion, as he's leaving, the sun is setting. It's getting dark. But when he returns, in the next Torah portion, it says the sun is rising. And so it's, it's quite uh, the story that God is developing here. But I want to start with the end of last week's Torah portion, which is the beginning of Genesis 28. Look at verse 1 through 5. Here we see Isaac calls his son Jacob. He blesses him, and then he charged him and said to him, you are not to take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And why did Isaac say that? The Canaanites are cursed. Okay. And that is why uh, Abraham told the Eliezer, when you go find a wife for my son Isaac, don't marry the Canaanites. And if you remember, Ham is the father of Canaan who was cursed. And Shem is still alive during Abraham's time. They've all died, but uh, Shem is still alive. And so he's talking to Abraham for almost 75 years, telling him all about the trip on the boat and everything that happened and how Ham was cursed and Canaan was cursed. And so that's why Abraham, who knew Shem, he even knew Noah for 15 years. And so, I mean, he got a, a, some good lessons. And so he told Eliezer, make sure Isaac doesn't marry Canaanite. And then Isaac, you know, tells his son Jacob, make sure you don't marry a Canaanite. And Esau was 40 years old when he got married. And the first thing he did was marry two Canaanites. And he saw that mom and dad, Isaac and Rebecca, were not too happy with his choices. And so it says that Esau, in Genesis 28, 8, 9, seeing that the daughters of Canaan did not please Isaac, his father, then Esau went to Ishmael and took the wives which he had, Mahalat, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nabaioth, to be his wife. So now we begin the Torah portion with verse 10. And Jacob, Vayetze, he went out from Beersheba. He went toward Haran. And then it says, and depends on your translation. I don't know what it says in the Korean or the Russian or the Spanish. But it says in the English here, in one of the 900 different English translations, uh, he came to a certain place. Another translation says he lighted on a certain place. Whenever it says a certain place, that tells us there's something very special about this particular place. And when it says he lighted on it or came to, the Hebrew word is paga. Now, what's fascinating about this particular word, which means he came to, and we know he came to a certain place, the word paga means a place where there will be a divine encounter. So you miss that in English. This certain place that he came to was a place he would have a divine encounter. And then it says, he tarried there all night because the sun was set. And then he took of the stones of that place, put them for pillows, and lay down in that place. Notice how it keeps talking about that place, that place, certain place. So this place is very important. It's too bad he didn't have my pillow back then. <laughs> he had to use a rock for pillows. Okay. So Jacob's descent from the land of promise, we have to think of as a descent into darkness. So Jacob's exile is also symbolic of spiritual darkness. All right. But this is a divine place that he came to. As a matter of fact, the word, the place, is in Hebrew, makom, 
that certain place is makom. Well, guess what? The root word of this is kum, which means to rise up. And guess what happened? This place is Jerusalem. And this is where the Lord was risen up. So this is incredible that the very word of the place, this important place, is a divine encounter. And it comes from the word, a place where there will be resurrection from the dead. Right in that word. So this is a very special place. Now, let me show you this. Okay, here is the same sentence, but I have the Hebrew and the Hebrew transliteration here. And uh, what's so exciting about what Danny and I are doing, too, is, is because in the, the Torah that we're doing, of course, you'll have the Hebrew, you have the Hebrew transliteration, and then you'll also have the English, but we're replacing all the English errors. But I have the red arrow pointing to the word ha Evan, And ha is what in Hebrew? The. The. Okay. Eben, as you can see in the Hebrew transliteration, ha in black underline, red underline is Evan. The. Okay. Now, look at the stone in English. I underlined the stone because that's ha Evan, and up there is ha Evan. Now, Let's look at the word for stone is the Aleph Beit Noon. And you can see that up top, the Aleph Beit Noon. That's the word for stone. And then what's fascinating is the Aleph Tav stone. And of course, the Aleph Tav isn't really translated into English. It refers to the direct object. But I think it's fascinating that God is the Aleph Tav. So this is the Aleph Tav stone. Okay. Now. Watch this. In Psalm 118.22, concerning the stone, there's a stone that the builders refuse, and it's what become the headstone of the corner. So we know there, this, why do they reject the stone? Well, watch this up on the screen very closely. Av is father. Ben is son. We have the word stone means the father and son together as one. And that's what they rejected. Isn't that amazing? The stone the builders rejected and the stone is made up of the father and the son in the Hebrew word for stone as one stone. Now, how many of you have ever been on the temple mount? Okay, some of you have. I've been up there many times. And, of course, the, this is called the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And then over there, what do they call that big gold dome there? It's the Dome of the Rock. Why is it called the Dome of the Rock? Because inside is the very rock Abraham was going to slay Isaac on. This is where the Holy of Holies was. The Holy of Holies was right here over the dome of the rock where Jacob's father, Isaac, was almost killed by his grandpa, Abraham. So that's why they call it the dome of the rock, because it has inside the foundation of the world. This, is, this was the rock that Abraham was going to offer up Isaac on. Now, what's fascinating about the dome of the rock, and I have uh, my own pictures of this. I've gone right up next to it. And you can see these mosaics on here. Do you see those? Here is one mosaic I cannot believe, but it's so fitting for the Dome of the Rock. What do you see? Do you see Satan? You have his two eyes, his mouth, ears, and it's reversed. Does anybody see that? Do you see what I'm talking about? Isn't that crazy? Anyway, so let's go on. Now, we read that what Jacob did after he woke up, uh, he erected a pillar and he poured oil on it. And then he named this site Bethel, which means the house of God, which is why the house of God was built there. And uh, Jacob, he's sleeping on a stone, and then God reveals this ladder all the way to heaven. Let's bring in our ladder. Dun, dun, dun. 
all the way to heaven. Now, uh, sleep often represents death in the Bible. The latter itself represents the Messiah with his death and resurrection being symbolic of Messiah's descent and ascent. And now the Lord appears to him for the very first time. And look at Genesis 28, 12, and 13. He dreams, and behold, a ladder is set up on the earth, and the top of it reached all the way to heaven. And then it says, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending, and behold, the Lord stood above it. You know what's amazing? It's referring to the ladder, but there, the every noun is either he. Uh, is either masculine or feminine, like in Spanish, and this really, there is no it in the Bible. This literally could be read, behold, the Lord stood above him. So he's looking down at him, and he said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land that you're lying to you, I will give it and to your seed. And so here we see these angels are coming in his dream, and then we have other angels, and they're ascending and descending. Now, the sages always wondered, why were they ascending and descending? Well, it's shift change, okay? The ones that are ascending are the ones who are the angels over the Holy Land. The ones that are descending are the ones that will accompany him out of the Holy Land, which I thought was kind of interesting as well. Now. The sages even disagreed, saying the angels were not going up and down it, but were going up and down him, as if the Messiah himself is the ladder that the angels are descending upon. As a matter of fact, if you look at John 1, 49 through 51, Nathaniel says to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You're the Messiah. You are the King of Israel. And Yeshua answered and says, you have faith because I told you I saw you under a fig tree. You're going to see greater things than this. And he said, truly, I tell everybody, you will see heaven opening and God's angels going up and down, coming down on what? That's what I'm saying. The New Testament even confirms it was the Messiah that is the connection between heaven and earth. And look at Isaiah 33, 22. The Lord is our judge. Now, when you see all caps, that means the Hebrew word is what? yud heh The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king, and he will save us. And here, Nathaniel just called him the king of Israel. He's saying, you are deity. Now, along that line, look at John 3, verse 13. No one has ascended up to heaven, but the one that came down from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. So he descended and then he ascended. Now look at this drum roll. Proverbs 30 verse four talks about this. Who has ascended up into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has bound the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? Okay, so this is a quiz. Okay, we're having a quiz. Who's the one who established all the ends of the earth? God, the Yudei Vave. But look at this. It says, what is his name and what is his son's name, if you know? Uh Uh-oh, there's two beings here. There's what is his name, what is his son's name? Now, what do the Jews all call God's name? They don't say yud hey vav hey because they don't want to say the name of God. Hashem. Hashem. Ha is the. Name is Shem. So here is the hey, the shin, and the m, the mem. So that's how you spell Hashem. I want everyone to see. Look at these letters. The hey, the shin, the mem. The na- what is his name? So if you were a Jew and you were going to answer this, what is his name? You would say Hashem. What is his son's name? I don't know. Okay? But are you ready for this? This is going to be mind-blowing, off the charts. I put Hebrew or Proverbs 30, 4 through 6 in an Excel spreadsheet. Now, what I have here, 
The letter mem is where verse four starts. And of course it goes this way and every line keeps going all the way till it ends, verse six ends with the top. In yellow here is where it says, and what is his name? And you see the vav is the word end. Ma is what? Shem is name. And then you have the vav at the end is his son's name. Or, or his name, I mean. I'm sorry. Yeah. What is his son's name? So here in Hebrew is the phrase, what is his son's name? And then down here, it says, and don't you be adding to his words. Okay. Now, what is his name? Hashem. Well, look at this. Right there is the word Hashem. In code, it's telling us, well, his name is Hashem. So right there, it tells us when you combine that, well, it's Hashem. Well, what is his son's name? Well, guess what? There is Yeshua. Right here is Yeshua. That is his son's name. Okay, right there. Yeshua. And it forms a cross. Hashem and Yeshua. Now, but wait. There's more. Here, Yeshua was baptized, and straightway he comes up out of the water, and what happens? The heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, what's the Hebrew word for spirit? Ruach. The resh, the vav, and the het. Well, guess what? Right here is the Ruach, the Spirit of God descending upon Yeshua in that very verse over the cross. But wait, there's even more. Here it is, Proverbs 30, verse 4. What is his name and what is his son's name? Okay, here we have what is Ma, Shemo. Okay, his son's name, and what is his son's name, if you can tell? Well, I want you to notice this. Here in Exodus, where they're calling out the manna, now we know Yeshua was the bread from heaven. He is the manna, and look at this. It says, now your English translations aren't actually correct, because again, it says it, but it's masculine. So it really should say, and the house of Israel call his name, manna. So right there is telling you the, one of the Messiah's name is manna. And I want you to notice it's the mem and the noon. Do you see that? That is the manna. But the reason why we can do that is because up here, it's the same thing. And it is his name. Well, right here is also the word man or manna. So what is his name? Wow, he's manna, the bread that came down from heaven. And it's Yeshua. So anyway, I always thought that was pretty cool. Okay, now go to Genesis 28, 15. God is saying to Jacob, look, I'm with you, and I'm going to keep you everywhere you go. And then he says, I'm going to bring you back. I'm not going to leave you until I've done that which I have spoken to you of. So here Jacob slash Israel leaves, but there's a promise he's going to return. And so in verse 17 through 19, Jacob is terrified, and he said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. This is why I love going to Jerusalem and going up to the Temple Mount. That is the very gate of heaven. It's, oh my gosh, when you're there, heaven's a local call. Okay, <clears throat> and it says, Jacob rose up early in the morning, and he took the stone, not just any stone, the Aleph Tav, the father and the son stone that he put for his pillows. He set it up for a pillar. Then he pours oil on it, like we said, and he called the name of that place Bethel. Now, some people, there's a city called Bethel in Israel, but that's not the Bethel he's referring about. You can have a Palestine, Alabama, and that doesn't make it Palestine. Okay, so... This is the first anointing in the Torah, 
is him pouring oil on that rock. And of course, the anointing is the word Mashiach, meaning Messiah. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, Genesis 28, 20 through 22, Jacob takes an oath and he says, if God's going to be with me and he keeps me safe and gives me food and clothing so that I come back again to my father's house, then I will take the Lord to be my God. And this stone, which I put up for a pillar, will be God's house. And of all you give me, I will give a tenth. So here where he's initiating a tithing concept. But I think it's interesting. It says, but if you don't, God, it's not going to happen. <laughs> he's testing God. Okay, chapter 29, 1 and 2. So Jacob goes on his journey, comes to the land of the people of the east. He looks, there's a well in the field, and there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well, they watered all the flocks. And look at this. There was a great stone on the mouth. And then in Genesis 29, 4 through 6, Jacob said to them, Brother, and where did you come from? And they said, we come from Haran. And he said, whoa, have you any knowledge of Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, yes. And he said, is he well? And they said, he is. And here is his daughter, Rachel, coming with the sheep. Now, do you know what the Hebrew name for Rachel means in Hebrew? She's a lamb. She's the lamb, a she lamb, a you. Okay, so what happens in Genesis 29, 10, and 11? When Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob went near. He rolled the stone from the well's mouth. You can see he's trying to impress her with how strong she is. You know, ah, I'll move this rock. And watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother, and Jacob kissed Rachel, and he lifted up his voice and wept. What's fascinating, that's the same thing that Esau did. He lifted up his voice and wept when he realized he didn't get the blessing. Well, so then what happens? Here we are in Genesis 29, 15. I mean, if you remember, Laban thought he really scored when Eliezer came for Rebekah, his sister, because he saw all the money. And now here comes Jacob, and he's looking for the money. <laughs> and he don't have any. And so he's a little disgusted. But he says to uh, Laban says to Jacob, because you're my brother, should you serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? And in verse 18 through 20, we see that Jacob loved Rachel. And he said, I will serve you for seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, oh, it's better I give her to you than I should give her to someone else. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, but they seemed like a few days for the love he had to her. Okay, now, who's the elder of Jacob and Esau? Esau. Who's the elder of Rachel and Leah? So Leah belonged to Esau anyway. Okay, and then Rachel belonged to Jacob, and that's who he wants. But what happens, we know what happens in Genesis 29, 25 through 27. In the morning, Jacob saw that it was Leah. He may have had too much to party on. <laughs> and he said to Laban, what have you done? Wasn't I working for you so that I might have Rachel? Why have you been false to me? And Laban said, in our country, we don't let the younger daughter be married before the older. Then he said, let the week of the bride feast. Now. What does that tell you when you read the week of the bride feast? Seven days, which also implies seven years. Like the tribulation, the bridal feast is seven years. The wedding takes place on the first day, and the wedding supper takes place on the seventh day. Now, as I told you, there's going to be some people who make it to the wedding, and then there's going to be some people who don't make it to the wedding, but they make it to the wedding feast. This is, you know, eschatology, but I, I want you to kind of get a load of this. Okay, and so what happened, Jacob actually got both at the same time, but he had to work another seven years to earn the fact that he gets both of them at the same time. So he said, let the week of the bride feast come to its end, and we will give you the other in addition, if you will be my servant for another seven years. And so Jacob did so and fulfilled her week and gave him Rachel, his daughter, to wife. 
Now, here's a couple of interesting things. Get a load of this. Now, this is really important to catch this. I want you to realize when Jacob started working, he was only he was 77 years old. When he worked the first seven years, he was 84 years old when he got both Rachel and Leah. He works the seven years for Rachel, okay, and the seven more years. So now Joseph is born when Jacob is 91 years old, and then he has to work six years for the livestock. You realize when Jacob wrestles the angel, he's 97 years old. This is your biblical math. Can you imagine? 97 years old, and he won. <laughs> All right. And Joseph at this time when he was wrestling the angel was six years old. Now, let me uh, set it this way for you. He worked seven years for Rachel, and of course, they had no kids. Okay, now he gets both, but he has to work another seven years, and that's when all the kids were born. Okay, so he had 13 kids in seven years, all right, because he's got four wives. And then the last six years, when he worked for the livestock, no more kids are born. The last kid is Benjamin, and he's not born until they're already in the promised land. All right? So I want to show you how math is so much fun. Look at this. If he worked a total of 20 years, but Reuben is born the first year when he gets both of them, how old is Reuben going to be when he leaves? He's going to be like 13 years old. So I want you to see that the math tells you how old all the kids were when he wrestled the angel. And so here, Leah had four kids first, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And then Bilah had her two, and Zilpah had her two, and then Leah had three more, and then Rachel finally had Joseph because Leah had Dinah, all right? So when you look at this, these are the ages of all the kids. Joseph and Dinah are both six years old when they left. This is the order of their birth. We know that from reading the context, who was born when. We know it takes a nine months to have a baby. And so, but when you look at the other wives, you can see within that seven year period, and what, six plus seven? 13, hello, seven years. And then when they remember when... Um, they raped Dinah, okay? Dinah was only 10 years old. That's how old she was. And the boys, when they killed all of them for what they did to Dinah, they were in their teens. They were 14, 15, and 16 years old when they slew all of the Shechemites in Shechem. And then you can see how old they were when they sold Joseph. You can see how old they were when they entered Egypt. And then how old they were when Jacob uh, blessed them and they were about to die. So that's what this chart uh, shows you. And then we find here in uh, Genesis 29, 22, and 23, it says, Labor, Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. You know what this is? The first bachelor party <laughs> mentioned in the Bible. It's right here. It's biblical to have bachelor parties. And they made a feast, and it came to pass in the evening. He took Leah's daughter and brought her to him, and he went unto her. Okay, so at this uh, bachelor party, he was 77 years old, Jacob was, at his bachelor's party. Okay, so uh, let's go to Genesis 29, 25 through 27. It says, in the morning, Jacob saw it was Leah, and he said, Laban, what have you done? Was I not working for you that I might have Rachel? And uh, he says, I'm not working for you. Uh, why have you been false to me? Laban said, in our country, we don't do this. All right. So Genesis 29, 33, Leah conceives again and bore another son and said, because the Lord has, what? Heard. I was hated. He's therefore given me this son also. And she called his name, what? Simeon. Well, guess What? The second half is all about Simeon. So we're going to talk all about Simeon and where this name came from. But one thing I want you to notice is she was hated. Now, how many of you know 
sometimes the baby picks up all your emotions, you know. And here, she's feeling like she's totally hated all this time. And then in Genesis 29, 34 and 35 uh, is where she ca called his name Simeon. And then 34 and 35, uh, she was with child again, gave birth to son, and said, Now, at last, my husband will be united to me because I've given him three sons. So his name was Levi, which means to join. And she was with a child again, gave birth to a son, and she said, this time I will praise the Lord. So he was named Judah, which means to praise. After this, she had what? No more children for a time. She ends up having three more, okay? Uh, uh, Zebulun, Issachar, and Dinah. Now, let's go to Genesis 35 through 8. And so Rachel is all upset and gives him Bilhah, and she gave birth to a son, and Rachel says, God has been my judge, has given ear to my voice, has given me a son. So he was named Dan, and Dan means judge. And again, Bilhah, Rachel's servant, was with child and gave birth to a second son. And Rachel said, I have had a great fight with my sister. I've overcome her. And she gave the child the name of Naphtali, which means to wrestle. Okay, now as we wrap things up, look at Genesis 30. Verse 9 through 13, when it was clear to Leah that she would have no more children for a time, she gives Zilpah her servant to Jacob as a wife. And Zilpah, Leah's servant, gave birth to a son, and Leah said, oh, it has gone well for me, and she gave him the name of Gad. And then Zilpah, Leah's servant, gave birth to a second son, and Leah said, happy am I, and all the women will give witness to my joy, and she gave him the name happy. Asher means happy. And then look at Genesis 30, verse 18 and 19. Leah said, God has made payment to me for giving my servant girl to my husband. So she gave her son the name of Issachar. And then uh, she became pregnant with a child and she gave Jacob a sixth son. And then in verse 20 and 21, she said, God has given me a good bride price. Now at last will I have my husband living with me, for I've given him six sons, and she gave him the name Zebulun, and after that she had a daughter to whom she gave the name Dinah. And then in Genesis 30, 24, she gave this next child, Rachel gave her child Joseph, saying, may the Lord give me another one, which, or another son, which means to add, okay, and that's what happened. She ended up having Benjamin. But look at Genesis 31, 41. Here we see exactly what I was talking about. Jacob says, these 20 years I've been in your house. I was your servant for 14 years, okay? Seven years for each daughter. Six years I kept your flock, and 10 times was my payment changed. I think it's interesting. At the very beginning, Laban said, what do you want your wages to be? It doesn't matter. He's going to change it 10 times anyway, you know. But uh, I just wanted you to catch the idea that it's 20 years and therefore, we know how old these kids were when they left. And then in Genesis 32, verse 1 through 4, on his way, Jacob comes face to face with the angels of God. And when he saw them, he said, this is the army of God. So he gave that place the name of Mahanaim, which is like two hosts, two armies, one on earth and the one in heaven. And then Jacob sends servants before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, which is the country of Edom. And look at what he said. He gave them orders. I want you to tell Esau these exact words that your servant Jacob says till now I've been living with Laban. So I think it's interesting that Jacob says, look, I'm your servant Esau. Okay, he's got a bunch of teenagers and he's thinking, you know, how in the world are they going to defend me against Esau and all of his army? Uh, now, quiz, some of you know this. Who was one of Esau's grandchildren? His first grandchild. Esau's first grandchild. Amalek! Amalek. And do you remember what the name Amalek means? Hittite means terrorist. What does Amalek mean? 
a nation who chops up body parts. And that's exactly what happened on October 7th. Hamas came in, which means violence. And they were chopping up body parts. And so his grandson is Amalek. Now, which son of Jacob gave him the first Jewish grandchild? Which one of the sons, the 12 tribes, gave him his first grandson that was Jewish? Drum roll. All right, I will tell you. It was Judah. Now, if you remember, Judah first married a Canaanite and had three kids by a Canaanite mother, so they're not considered Jewish. But he ended up lying with Tamar, his son's wife, and who was born, Peretz and Zerah. And so Peretz is the line of David. When you go to the end of the book of Ruth, <clears throat> it talks about the genealogy of Peretz, and we see that's where David comes from. And so I think it's fascinating. You have Peretz versus Amalek, and then you end up having uh, David from the tribe of Judah versus Goliath, okay? And that brings us down to the church today. I believe we have the woke church and the awakened church. The woke church is going to go back to all their pagan gods like Oprah did, Orpah, and not Oprah, <laughs> but Orpah. And, but the awakened church, they're the ones that are going to befriend Israel. So with that said, let's stand. All right. <clears throat> Avinu Makenu, our Father King, we just thank you so much that we're able just to look into your Torah portion and uh, go hash out the history again and take a look at things and reveal to us things that we've never seen before. And Father, I just want to thank you right now for all of the lights, the lights of the world all around here locally, around the United States, around the whole world. How precious are these lights that are wanting to magnify the Torah, make it honorable once again. We thank you for any tithes, offerings, donations that come in because it's not for us. It's for you, and we want to use this to help reach all of the nations of the world that they could see the light of your Torah. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with a whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Okay, are you ready? You buckled up? Okay, what we're talking about now is the times and seasons. Like I always say to, I ask Christians, are we supposed to know the times and seasons? And they go, yes. And I go, what time is it? Oh, I don't know. What season is it? Oh, I don't know. So I'm going to tell you how to know the times and seasons. Now, here again is how all the tribes were around the tabernacle. And what we've covered is spring. We've talked about on the east side, Judah went first, representing the month of Nisan. And then that's the first month of the religious calendar. And then came the second month is Iyar, represented by Issachar. They would be the second tribe to march. And then Zebulun is third, representing the month of Savon. This is when Pentecost Shavuot is. And so we've got those done. And then we come to the southern side, representing summer. And last week, we did the month of Tammuz, which represents Reuben. And it has to do with what? Vision, sight. Reuben is C. And now we're going to Simeon, which is the month of Av. All right? Now we remember Reuben is when they, in that month, they worshiped the golden calf. And they also sent the spies for a whole month. But Av is when they came back and they brought the bad report. Now, let's. Look at this. Here we go. So Simeon is the tribe for the month of Av. And I have like the new moon all the way to the final phase. And does anybody know what this word is up here in Hebrew? C. 
Simeon. Okay? That's the S M E O N, Simeon. And this is the month of Av, which is the fifth month. Okay? Now, one of the amazing things about Simeon, if you separate the words, you have, there is sin. Like the word Shema means hear and obey. Well, the Shin, Mem, Yud, or, I mean, Ayin means Shema. Like the word Simeon, you hear the word Shema in there? Simeon means to hear. So last month was the month of sight. This month is the month of hearing. But the whole thing is, they're not hearing. This is the month we can hear from God, and he's speaking to us, and we will either block our ears and say, I don't want to hear what you're saying, God, or you'll hear but not listen. Y'all know the difference between hearing and listening. Okay, so the month of Ab. Let's begin with Genesis 29, 33. She conceives again and bear a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I was hated. He's given me this son, and she called his name Simeon. Now, let's talk a little bit about the man Simeon. What, what we do is, on every one of these, I tell you about the month and the meaning of the month and the man and the meaning of the man and how they correlate. In Genesis 34, 25 and 26, it says, It came to pass on the third day, this is when they kill all of the Shechemites for raping Dinah that I talked about earlier today. And these guys are teenagers. It says, when they were sore, that the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took each man his sword. They came upon the city boldly, and they killed everybody, all the males. And they slew Hamor, the father of Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword, and they took Dinah out of Shechem's house, and they left. Okay, so the first thing we know about Simeon, uh, he's one angry guy. And Simeon, in one sense, the sages say, held to, he believed justice had to be done. But how often do we know some people that only pursue justice they can be really cruel. They, they have no mercy. And it's almost like Torah terrorists. There are a lot of people who follow Torah, and they want everything just right, and they don't ever show mercy to anybody. That's not what we're to be. We're not to be wanting justice so much in the sense that we become terrorists. What's interesting, summer, when you think of summer, what do you think of? Heat. And we talk about the heat of someone's anger. So here we are in the summer, and these are a couple of hotheads. And they go together. Now, in observing commands, when we do obey the commands of God, it should not lead one to depression and anger or a loss of joy. A person... Uh, the thing we have to realize, keeping the commandments isn't grievous. That's what it says in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. He says the commandments aren't grievous. But whenever we always pursue only strict justice, the Torah commands become a burden. But when we realize these are gifts and it's to be happy and joyful, just like a little kid. How many of you know a little five-year-old hates the fence around the house? They want to go play in the street. And they hate the fence, but when they get older and have a kid, they love the fence. What changed? It wasn't the fence that changed. And so God, when it comes to the keeping the commandments, we get a new heart, and then we want to keep them. That is what the whole process of salvation is all about. Um, and here's something else that I thought was fascinating. If our goodness only extends to heaven and not to other people, it's not good. In other words, if, if we all do these wonderful things, we're always doing it for God, but we're not going to do wonderful things for these other humans, that's not good. If we have strict justice, you know, toward others, you know, how many of you know that oftentimes the people that are accusing people do the very same things? That's what happens. That's what happens. You know, and that, you know, for me, it's always mercy, show them mercy, because I want mercy. Um, 
So let's look at Genesis 49, how it goes on in, in verse 5 through 7. This is when Jacob is blessing the 12 tribes. And did you know Simeon is the only tribe that is never blessed? Simeon isn't blessed by Jacob, and he's not blessed by Moses in his final words. But let's see what happens. Dad says, Simeon and Levi are instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. Oh, my soul, don't come into their secret, unto their assembly, my honor, be not thou united. For in their anger, they slew a man. In their self-will, they dug down a wall. Curse be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Wow. Okay, Simeon and Levi like to kill. So God says, okay, Levi, you get to kill animals. I'm going to keep you by my side. <laughs> Levites, okay, you, that's in your blood. You want to kill. We'll make you in charge of killing all the sacrifices. And Simeon, neither one of them got a land portion. Levi never got a land portion, and Simeon never got a land portion. Simeon was absorbed into Judah's land portion. And so here we see Simeon. I want you to think of them as fierce anger, cruel wrath, murderers. Okay, this is a, the concept of Simeon. Simeon is a guy that is full of anger. And I think it's fascinating. He's full of hatred. And yet his mother thought she was hated the whole time. And it's like this hatred that she's experiencing is passed on to the child. But... The other thing, the gemstone is the topaz. So Simeon's gemstone is topaz. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 6 through 24, Moses is blessing all of the tribes, and Simeon isn't even mentioned. He skipped over. There is no blessing. And then... Let's look at what happens when they're entering the promised land. Look what Joshua says. It says the second lot came out for Simeon, even for the tribe of the children of Simeon, according to their families, and their inheritance was in the midst of the inheritance of the children of Judah. They didn't get their own land. And so here, the Levites... Jacob said would be scattered, and they were scattered. They were among every tribe the Levites were. And Simeon, they were scattered all over the land of the tribe of Judah. But if you remember the order of their birth, you have Reuben, Levi, Simeon, and Judah, right? So Simeon was close to his older brother Levi, but he's absorbed into Judah. He becomes close with Judah as well. And so look at this. In Joshua 19, verse 9, it goes out and it says, Out of the allotment of the children of Judah was the inheritance of the children of Simeon. It says, For the portion of the children of Judah was too much for them. Therefore, the children of Simeon had inheritance in the midst of their inheritance. So whenever you see a chart showing all the tribes, you'll never see Simeon all by himself. And so look what happens. In Judges chapter 1, verse 3, Judah. Here you see a relationship between Judah and Simeon because they're going to be combined in the land portion. And Judah says to Simeon, Come up with me into my lot that we may fight together against the Canaanites, and I'll also go with you into your lot. So Simeon went with him. Now, we know what happens in the month of Av. The temple is destroyed twice in 586 BC and in 70 AD. Both times, the Babylonians and the Romans destroyed the temple on the very same day, the ninth of Av. Okay, and so Av begins, this is the main thing about the month of Av. The month of Av is like evening and morning. The whole month, it starts out horrible, but it ends fantastic. 
It's like at the beginning, the child gets a real good spanking by dad, and then dad holds him and loves him. So Av is a, as a month that's made of the first half of Av is horrible. The second half of Av is comforting Judah. That's why we, during the ninth of Av, you have the dire straits for three weeks, and then have, you have seven weeks of consolation. So, one, the first half of Av is like going into exile, and then the other half is like the redemption. Now, one thing people don't know, at Passover, which is Nisan, which is the month of Judah, there's a boiled egg, a brown boiled egg. Well, that represents the destruction of the temple on the ninth of Av, all right? So, I don't know if you knew this, but the ninth of Av always falls on the same day of the week as Passover. If, I mean, Passover can be a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Whenever it falls, the ninth of Av always falls on the very same day. And so we know Passover, Nisan, represents redemption. Okay, it represents freedom. And the ninth of Av represents bondage and destruction. So one represents bondage and destruction, and then we get to Nisan where you're redeemed and you get a return. Listen to this. I don't know if you knew this, but in Genesis chapter 37, verse 20, when Joseph was coming to check on his brothers, it says, come now, they therefore let us slay him, cast him into a pit, and we'll just say some evil beast devoured him, and we'll see what will become of his dreams. It was Simeon who wanted to kill him. And this is why Joseph keeps Simeon instead of the other brothers and sends them back. Now, look at Genesis 37, four verses later. They took Joseph, and what did they do? They cast him into a pit. Guess what? It was Simeon who threw him in the pit. And again, this is why he held Simeon back and sent the other ones back home. And look what happens in Genesis 42, 21 through 24, when Joseph is testing his brothers. They said one to another, we are very guilty concerning our brother. We saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and what happened? We would not hear. Here we have. The month of Av means to hear. And here's what happened. They heard him, but they did not hear him. They heard him crying out, but they didn't hear his anguish. They didn't hear his pain. And he says, this is why the distress has come upon us. And then Reuben answered and said, didn't I tell you don't sin against a child and you wouldn't hear? <laughs> and so, uh, therefore, behold, his blood is required. And they did not know that Joseph heard them and understood them, for he spoke by an interpreter. And now Joseph turns himself about from them and wept, returned to them again and communed with them and took from them what? which means to hear. He took their hearing away from them. When he's taking Simeon, which name means to hear, their hearing is taken from them, and that's who is held. Interesting parallel. It, uh, it says uh, that they bound him before their eyes. So, you know, in one sense, because they did not hear in the Exodus, they had to wander for 40 years. They would not hear. Look at Numbers chapter 13, verse 32. Here they have the 12 spies, and the 10 spies come back, and they spread an evil report of the land which they had spied out under the children of Israel, and listen to what they said. The land through which we have passed to spy it out is a land that eats up the inhabitants, and all the people we saw in it are men of great stature. Now, do you remember what I said, eat up its inhabitants means? They 
went out to spy out the land and everyone was dying. Okay, it's like God has sent a plague and everyone's dying and the earth is opening up its mouth while they're burying them all. So the earth is literally opening its mouth. They make dig graves and they bury them. They were terrified because everybody was dying. Now, remember, it's always about perspective. Is the water, is the glass half full or half empty? The two spies thought, hey, this is great. God's going ahead of us and killing everybody. The 10 bad spies says, this is horrible. They're all dying. Well, have everything, maybe God's trying to help you in this battle. It's all perspective. And so it says um, the problem was, who were they listening to? They weren't listening to God. They were listening to the 10 spies. So this month, in summer, May, June, when things are getting hot, we have to understand the month before, Tammuz, we got to be careful what we're looking at. Are we seeing correctly? And now in this month, not only does God want to help us with our sight, he wants to help us with our hearing. How many know you can tell something to someone and they will change it when they tell something else. I don't even know what I'm talking about. All of a sudden, they add something or subtract something. And so it's selective hearing. Have you ever heard of selective hearing? You know. Well, so that's what this month is about. Are we going to use selective hearing and not hear from the Lord, or are we going to hear from uh, man or God? And so look at Zechariah chapter 7. Look at verse 11 through 13. God says they refuse to do what? Hearken. They're not going to listen. They pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. You can just see someone visually. They are no, and they turn away and they cover their ears and they're walking away. They don't want to hear what you have to say. And that's what God is saying about his people. But look what they're turning away from that they don't want to hear. They made their hearts as hard as stone, lest they should hear the Torah. And it says, and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent by his spirit. Okay, the spirit and law go together. And much of Christianity, they see the spirit as against the law. Sorry, the spirit's the one who wrote the law. And then it says, by the former prophets, therefore what comes? Great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore, it came to pass, this is scary, Christians, that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried, and the Lord says, I will not hear them. Uh, God is saying, if you won't pick up the phone when I call, I'm not going to pick up the phone when you call. This is why this month of Av is so important. We need to work on discerning, am I hearing from God or am I hearing from man? Or I refuse to hear from God or I refuse to hear from man. I mean, this, are, this is huge. Now, concerning the month of Av, Av 1, the first day, which means what? A new moon. Whenever you read the first of the month, you always, I want you to think new moon because it's always based on the moon. That's the very day Aaron died. And what's special about this, nowhere in the entire Bible does it mention the day anybody died, except for Aaron. So there's something very significant about that. So here we see in Numbers 33, verse 38, Aaron the priest went up into Mount Or at the commandment of the Lord, and he died in the 40th year after the children of Israel will come out of the land of Egypt, in the fifth month, on the first day of the month, Aaron was 123 years old when he died in Mount Or. Okay, so we know Aaron dies on the first of Av. What is significant about him dying on the first of Av? Aaron was the very symbol of unity. Aaron was the one that tried to get everyone to get along. When you think of Aaron, think of someone who wants to make peace with everybody. Look at Psalms 
133, verse 1 and 2, it's a song of ascent. It says of David, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. How? And unity. It says it's like the precious oil on the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that comes down upon the collar of his garments. Do you know the context of this verse? What is going on? This is is on the first day of Nisan when the grand opening ceremony of Moses' tabernacle happened. And Moses is anointing Aaron, the high priest, with oil, and all the oil is pouring down on him. And if you remember, when Aaron first came out and said the priestly blessing, the fire never fell. It wasn't until Moses and Aaron were unified, went into the Holy of Holies together and came out, and Aaron blessed them, and the fire fell. And so it's all about unity coming together. Now, um, let's see. So that happened on the first of Av. So what does that tell us? When Aaron dies on the first of Av, disunity is coming this month. Okay, see, Aaron's symbolic of unity. On the first of Av, Aaron dies. So it's like the unity dies. And so Av becomes disunity. This is the ninth of Av. There's disunity between the 10 bad spies and the two good spies. There's disunity about everything that's going on. So we have to understand Av is the month. Of course, Av is what? Father. Dad. That's the thing. The very month is dad, and dad is heartbroken and has to spank the kids, and then he wants to comfort the kids. But why does he have to spank them? Because they're not listening. They're, what does it say? You know, a nation that's divided can't stand. This is where America is at right now. This is where Israel is at right now. And so we really have to have our ears. That's why, you know, every spot, give us eyes to see. Vision, give us ears to hear, hearing, so we can have clarity of what God is doing. So let's look at, uh, listen to, here's Malachi, chapter 2, verse 6. The law of truth was in Aaron's mouth, and unrighteousness was not found in his lips. He walked with me in what? Peace, uprightness. And look at this, Aaron turned many away from iniquity. Wow. But how does he walk with God in peace? It's because he has the Torah of truth is what he speaks. So Aaron's death was a sign of disunity and discord is what is coming. And great vengeance, which is Simeon. Look at Genesis. This is kind of interesting. Chapter 8, verse 3. Now, what we have to remember, Noah was not on the religious calendar. Noah was on the civil calendar where Tishri 1 is the first month rather than Nisan 1. That became the first month of the religious calendar. And when you see that, it says here the waters decrease continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month on the first day of the month, what do you think of when you're first day of the month? New moon. Okay. It's this time, uh, it is the first of Tammuz, where the tops of the mountain seen. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days, Noah opens the window of the ark, which he had made, and he sends out the raven, which went to and fro. And he sent forth a dove to see if the waters were baited from off the face, but the dove found no rest. He returned to the ark. The waters were still on the face of the whole earth. He put it in his hand. He took her and brought her into the ark. And then he stayed another seven days. All of this is happening in the month of Av. Here you have the chaos of the flood. And the dove during the month of Av is being sent out. The ravens being sent out. And the dove came back. And even tied with her uh, in her mouth was an olive leaf. And so Noah knew the waters were abated, and he stayed seven more days and sent forth the dove, and she never returned again. These events all happened during the month of Av. Now, I think it's interesting. The raven, it says, goes to and fro. 
Well, the raven is unclean. And look at Job 1.7. The Lord said to Satan, where did you come from? And Satan said to the Lord, I've been going to and fro throughout the earth. I think that's very fascinating. And from walking up and down in it. Uh, now, in uh, Genesis uh, 8, 10, 11, it just goes on and says the olive leaf was plucked out. They believed that the olive leaf was from an olive tree in Jerusalem, which is also fascinating. Um, you know, I, now I could be wrong. I'm just going to speculate here, but here's what my opinion is, for whatever it's worth. I believe the fig tree was the knowledge of good and evil, and this is why it says they covered themselves with fig leaves. The Torah actually is telling you it was a fig tree. And I believe the tree of life was an olive tree, which represents the oil, the anointing, the spirit. But regardless of that, let's look at some of these other things that happened in the month of Av. In 2 Kings 25, 8 through 14, it says in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, in the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, here comes Nebuzardan, who's the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon to Jerusalem. And he burnt the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and every great man's house burnt he with the fire. So I've got here this picture. Now this concerns the ninth of Av. This is when everything was totally destroyed. And here... Uh, it says on the seventh day of the month. Well, look at Jeremiah 52, 12 and 13. Here it says in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, which was the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar, captain of the guard, and served the king of Babylon to Jerusalem. And he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem, and all the houses of the great men burned you with fire. Okay, so one says it was the seventh day. One says it was the tenth day. Well, the reason they come up with the ninth of Bob is because that is when most all of this happened. It started at evening on the 7th, the flames, but it took a couple days, and it wasn't until the 9th of Av that everything is being destroyed until the 10th of Av. So actually, for some things to burn down when they're this big, it takes a couple of days. Okay, <clears throat> now look at this, Ezekiel 20. This is verse 1 through 3. It comes to pass in the seventh year, in which month? And what's the name of the fifth month? Off. And it's the tenth day of the month. Now, we just got done reading. In the month of Av, on the tenth day of the month, is when the temple's being destroyed. Jerusalem is being destroyed. But now we're in Ezekiel, and this is like 20 years later. And all of a sudden, everyone's coming together on that particular day. All right? Certain of the elders came to inquire of the Lord, and they sat before Ezekiel. And then the word of the Lord comes to Ezekiel, and he says, Son of man, you tell these children, or these elders of Israel, thus says the Lord God, have you come to inquire of me? As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired by you. In other words, if you don't hear me, I'm not going to hear you. You make this a special day to come to hear from the Lord. Too late. You missed the boat. You're not listening to me, so why should you inquire of me? You're not going to hear anyway. And look at Ezra. This is chapter 7, verse 8 and 9. Here we see Ezra, he's building the, he wants to build the temple, restore it. And he comes to Jerusalem in which month? Fifth month, which is the month of Av. And it was the seventh year of the king. And then it says, upon the first day of the first month. Okay, what comes to your mind when I say first day of first month? New moon. And what month is the first month? Nisan, Passover. Okay, so when you read this, I want you to think, wow, this is the new moon of Nisan. This is when he began to go from Babylon to Jerusalem. And look at this. On the first day of the fifth month, he gets there. So it took him three, four months from the first month of Nisan all the way to the first day of Av. So you go, wow, the first day of the first month to the first, notice the first day, how important the first day is. In the Bible, it's always significant, the new moon. This is when visions come. This is when all kinds of things happen. 
But anyway, I just want you to realize he's traveling, and it took him four months to travel from Babylon to Jerusalem. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate traveling sometimes. <laughs> okay, but here's the good news. Look at Psalms 103, verse 13 and 14. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so has the Lord compassion on those who fear him because he knows our frame. He remembers we're just a bunch of dirt. <laughs> You know, we're dust, and we're going to return to dust. This is why, I mean, you look at, why is the name Father given to a month of such tragedy and destruction? This is why in the New Testament, too, you know, if you're not going to be disciplined by dad, you're not his kids. How many of you discipline the neighbor kids? Some of you might. I <laughs> know. But, or you want to. But if you're getting spanked, you ought to be thankful that you have a relationship where he cares about you enough he's spanking you. You know, look at Judges 21, verse 18. It says, how be it we may not give them wives of our daughters, for the children of Israel had sworn, saying, cursed be he that gives a wife to Benjamin. Who does not know this story? I'll tell you this story really quick. What had happened, people from Benjamin had killed a lady, cut her up into pieces, and spread her all over the tribes of Israel. Well, all the tribes of Israel were so up upset at Benjamin that they went to kill Benjamin. They went to war against the tribe of Benjamin, and they killed a bunch of the men and almost all the women, and they had sworn to God that none of the tribes would ever give their sons to Benjamin to marry the daughters. Well, now what happens, they accomplish this, and the danger is overpassed, and now all the tribes are upset because they're going to lose the tribe of Benjamin because they don't have any daughters for the guys that survived to marry. And so they go, what are we going to do? We swore a curse upon anyone who would give one of their daughters. So they come up with an idea. I know. We can't give them them, but they can take them. And so what they did on Tuba Av, which is the 15th of Av, when all the women would go to Shiloh, where we're going to be going to in May, they would dance around. And then they told the men of Benjamin, as the virgins are all dancing around under the full moon, Okay, everyone knows full moon, romance, love. And so the men of the tribe of Benjamin all went and grabbed themselves wives from the other tribes because the men couldn't give their daughter, but the Benjamites could take their daughters. And so then they went around all the tribes and said, look, this is what happened, and this is why you lost your daughter to the parents. Okay, <clears throat> but look at this. In the same chapter, a few verses later, it says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did that which is right in their own eyes. But we're supposed to do what's right in the Lord's eyes. And that's what Tammuz is all about. And then after you get your vision perfected, you got to get your hearing perfected. Now, here's what's fascinating as well. This is Zechariah chapter 8, verse 19. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month. When is the fast of the fourth month and what is the fourth month? The fourth month is last, the month before this teaching. What is it? Tammuz. And what day in Tammuz would they fast? The 17th of Tammuz, because what happened on the 17th of Tammuz? That's when they worship the golden calf. But the reason they're fasting in this situation is because that is when Babylon broke through the walls of Jerusalem. Okay, so this is talking about when it says the fast of the fourth month, it is the 17th of Tammuz. And then it says the fast of the fifth month. What's the fast of the fifth month? What's the fifth month? Off. And it's the ninth of Av. Why? Because that's when the temple was 
destroyed. And then it talks the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth, which I will get to when I cover those months very soon. But all these have to do with the events that happened around the destruction of the temple. But here's my point. How many of you consider yourself in the prophetic movement and you want to hear from God? Well, guess what? If you don't know these fast days, when they are, you will never know when the prophecy is fulfilled that they'll go from fasting to rejoicing. Here, if you don't know these dates and you consider yourself in the prophetic movement, you're not very prophetic, you're more pathetic. Okay, what you have to do is get on God's calendar so you know when the prophecies are being fulfilled. Wow, this prophecy was fulfilled. Here's four dates on God's calendar where they're going to turn from fasting to feasting. And that hasn't happened yet. And so this is why we have to be on God's calendar. Now, look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. It talks about the Messiah. He has in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword. What do we know is a sharp, two-edged sword? The word of God. And that's what's coming out of his mouth. Okay, so... What does this mean? What is the meaning of the month of Av? The month of Av is a double-edged sword. You got half of it is bad, half of it is good. If someone is coming at you with a knife, if they're going to kill you, it's bad. If they're going to take your appendix out and heal you, it's good. Okay, so this month is a two-edged sword from Father it begins with disunity and destruction like the dire straits are going through, okay, uh, Tammuz and ending up in Av. But it ends with love, forgiveness, unity, redemption, which is why Simeon was consumed by Judah. In other words, when Messiah comes, Simeon will be redeemed, and it's with the tribe of Judah that Yeshua is from. Look at Genesis 45, 1 through 6. We'll go back to that. Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him. And he cries out, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him. Do you know what that means when it says there stood no man with him? It's Yom Kippur. It's the day of atonement the day of forgiveness. And it says here, while Joseph made himself known to his brethren, Joseph goes, guess what, guys? I'm your brother. And what is Yeshua going to do to the Jewish people on Yom Kippur? That he's going to go, hey, guess what? I'm not a European. I'm Jewish. I'm your brother. And he wept aloud and the Egyptians even heard it, and the house of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father yet alive? His brethren could not answer because they were afraid at his presence. And Joseph said to his brethren, come near, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, look, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold to Egypt. But don't be grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me here. God sent me before you to preserve life for how long? Two years has the famine been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. Okay, now I want to put your thinking caps on. Do you realize what this is saying? I want you to see beyond what you see. I want this to be analyzed. Do you know what day Joseph was brought out of the pit and appeared before Pharaoh? Okay. It tells you pretty much specifically in Genesis, it was Rosh Hashanah. It was the beginning of the year. Because it says at the end of two full years. And so here, Rosh Hashanah is the end of two years. Also, Joseph comes out of the pit, and he's to explain the dream that Pharaoh had. Okay, And he explains the dream. And then there were seven years of prosperity, and then there comes seven years of famine. When it says there's been two years of famine, that means it's Rosh Hashanah again. You following? So here, he appears on Rosh Hashanah. You have seven years of prosperity. 
two years of famine, and it is on Rosh Hashanah again that he's meeting with his brethren. And guess what comes after Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur? And it's on Yom Kippur, he's revealing himself to his brothers, and there's five years of uh, famine left. So these verses are talking about Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, but you know what this also tells me? That's when he reveals himself to his brothers, the second year of seven years of trouble. Could Messiah reveal himself to Israel on Yom Kippur at the second year of the tribulation? You following me? When you look at the patterns, Joseph revealed himself at the end of the second year of the seven years of famine. Could Messiah reveal himself on Yom Kippur at the end of the second year of the tribulation? Then you have the 144,000 all going. But I just want you to learn to see things deeper than what you read. Does that make sense? All right, let's stand.